observation. One more question. Um, sure. We're two readings, so we need to have out a bit of apology. And apology in Republic One. Yeah. Welcome. This is AP Senior English. Uh, for uh, Friday, the, the 14th of September. Let's make some quick observations uh, about the writing assessment packet that's coming on Tuesday. Uh, the readings will involve, of course, the, the notes of the packet uh, 10 through 13, as well as the Brownlee textbook 256 to 331, back to the packet, pages 1 through 4, bullet point, and page 5, questions 1 through 22. Those are all the annotative work. Now, what exactly is it that's the writing assessment work? And the writing assessment work here will be of your own choosing. However, you're working with two potential texts. One of those two texts would be the, uh, the, the um, uh, poetics, and then the other would be Oedipus Rex itself. Question, Mr. Stone? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Did you uh, told us to put Antigone on back here? That package. Antigone is also on the packet. I apologize, you're right. Antigone is also on the packet. Pages 6, 7, bullet point of that packet. 8 questions, page 8 questions, 1 through 20. Page 9 questions, 1 through 9. And the outline of questions, 1 through 5. Which means that you also can write your paper on the play Antigone if you so choose. And technically Aeneid Book 2 should be in that packet. Because um, we didn't put it in the last packet. You did not put an EA2 in the last packet, so that's right. So an EA2, and, there, and, that, and that would add one potential, <coughs> one more potential text for you. So, I'm sorry? What if you did? Yeah, that, if, you, if you did put it in, then that's fine too. Okay. Right, right. Okay? Questions, comments? I want to turn now back to the notes of Oedipus Rex. So let's go there, back to our observations of yesterday. I want to finish with those observations. And we'll be ready to uh, do a little review. I'll tell you in advance that my plans are next Tuesday to give a lecture on Antigone. So come in ready to talk about that. I would say at some point, I would say not now. You don't want to miss the intel that I'm about to give, but maybe orange period would make some sense. Remember, though, if you're going to do it during orange period, that you get a pass that's orange from the back of the... Fill it out and have me sign it so that way you can leave. All right. Oedipus Rex, Sophocles Offering. Okay. Oedipus Rex, Sophocles Offering. For Aristotle is the greatest of all of the plays. The reason is because for Aristotle, he believes this play will elicit the greatest amount of catharsis, the word that we were using yesterday. So I want to go back now to this idea of yesterday. We'll even finish with some observations that Mr. Schreiber took us to yesterday, and that is, how do you explain the phenom that is Titanic? By the way, at this point now, we're not asking whether you like or dislike the, the movie Titanic. Rather, we're interested in how you explain the phenomenon that is Titanic. Let's go to work now. We, uh, I want to do some quick review, though, first. So, Ms. Ramos, uh, yesterday we said that Aristotle said in Poetics that he concentrates on the fall of the protagonist, right? And what was that word that we used yesterday? It's there in your packet as well. It'll probably end up on the test, which is why I'm asking you now. It's a little review. What is that word? The yeah, the, yes, yes, but what is the Greek word that we worked with? It's an H word. There's actually two H words that we, we talk about hamartia, don't we? we talk about hamartia. Uh, what leads to that tragic fall of the protagonist? Remember, the protagonist begins high and will end low. But it's not the fall so much that interests um, Aristotle as much as it is the response of the audience the audience will, what was our word yesterday? Identifies with the fall of the protagonist. What does that even mean? Well, let's go back now to our finishing comments regarding Oedipus Rex. Oedipus will meet on the road his father and not know it. He will kill Laius in hand-to-hand -hand combat. He will answer the riddle of the Sphinx. 
He will be invited to become king of Thebes and to marry the beautiful Jacusta. And in this process, and for the way, by the way, for those of you that are saying, yeah, but it's his mom and she's so much older, remember, and you know this already from your study of Romeo and Juliet, it's altogether possible that when Jacusta marries Laius, Laius is in his 40s while she may be in her teens. Remember, you already saw this project when Paris comes to Capulet and requests the hand of Juliet. Juliet's not even 15 years old. Clearly, Paris is quite a bit older, right? So you have a dynamic in play where Jacusta could actually be closer in age to her own son, Oedipus, than she would be to her husband, Laius. Needless to say, Marrying Jacusta is not about sex. That isn't why he does it, because she finds her hot and he wants to marry her. No, no, no. He's being offered the invitation to become king of Thebes, not unlike those suitors who are trying to marry Penelope, and it's got nothing to do with they find Penelope stunningly hot or any of that. They want Penelope because then they become king of the city. The same is true. So Oedipus becomes king of Thebes, when the play opens, the city is under um, plague. A prophet will say, bad, bad, bad situation here. And Oedipus is like, well, of course it's a bad situation. Everyone is dying of plague. No, no, no. The reason they're dying of plague is because the other king, Laius, many years ago, by this point, uh, um, Oedipus already has four kids. Two sons, Etocles, Polynices. Two daughters, of course we know Antigone, and who's the other one? How do we say? Ismini. So there's four kids that they've had together. Again, the key here is he has no idea. Back to our example of yesterday, it would be like you meeting in college an amazing person, marrying, having four children, discovering that you had a twin, going out in search of that twin, only to find out, whoa, how is it possible that this my twin who I never even knew about, ended up going to the same college as me. Whoa, how, oh, 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 oh. It's that moment. It's, oh, oh, whoa. It's that moment. It, that moment, notice, is completely clothed in ignorance. It's not like you went to college to meet your twin to marry him or her. No, no, no. That's a different play. The point here is that now Oedipus, it, he doesn't know, but he stands in front of the crowd and he says, moment of serious dramatic irony, I will get to the bottom of this. The man who killed the king Laius will be punished. I swear it. <laughs> of course, the audience, they all know already. Because this is not a storyline, and this is important, Mr. Batson, that I say it this way. Sophocles didn't invent this story. The story of Oedipus is a very, very ancient story. It's way pre-Sophoclean. The audience already knows the storyline, but they still, Aristotle says, derive some powerful emotional catharsis from watching a guy stand in front of the audience and say, I will get to the bottom of this because I want to be a good king. And he does want to be a good king, and he is a good king, so he's going to get to the bottom of it. Through a series of events that you've read about already, you know, the end of our play will culminate with at least two revelations. One, Oedipus will be told that the old man and woman who were his mother and father in Corinth are now gone, dead, and, they, and he doesn't have to worry anymore about killing his dad and marrying his mom. To which he can kind of go, Phew. The second revelation is, of course, that there was a there was a witness to the murder of Laius. And when he comes onto the stage, he immediately looks at Oedipus and he goes, Oh, you're the guy. What do you mean I'm the guy? Oh, you're the guy. You're the one that I saw fighting against, the, against King Laius on the side of the road. Uh, it's at that moment that Oedipus turns to find his wife, Mother Jacusta. She's not there. She's not there. A messenger will come back onto the stage to tell us that when Oedipus left the stage, he goes into the bedroom. What has happened to Jacusta, his mother, wife, mother? What has she done? She's hung herself in shame when she finally realizes it. Now, halfway through the play, Jacusta starts to figure it out. And she's saying things to her husband, uh, son, like, Shh, just, let's just drop this. Let's just, Oedip Oedipus, no, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. I'm a good king. I'm an honorable man. I'm going to get his... his stubbornness, his pride, his, what's the Greek word that starts with another Greek word that starts with an H? His hubris. 
Aristotle says, that's so important. As the audience watches Oedipus and his fall, the audience realizes, oh, we'll come back to the catharsis in a moment. Let's finish the play. We're told that Oedipus sees his wife mother there hanging dead. He will take pins that hold up her dress that have long pokey things in the back, and he will shove them into his eyes and immediately blind himself. Two interesting observations here. Notice, one, Oedipus doesn't commit suicide. He does not take his life. The Greeks will kind of look down on this whole suicide thing, unlike the Romans. The Romans will look at suicide falling on your sword, as you know from our final moments from Julius Caesar, with some kind of honor, right? If you're in an unwinnable situation, taking your own life is an honorable thing. But not so the Greeks. They will see in stories, like the story of, of course, Ajax, who wants so badly the armor of Achilles. He doesn't get it. He is, uh, he's embarrassed by the fact that he thinks he's killing and beating to death Odysseus. And in fact, of course, he's beat a bunch of sheep to death. And in the shame of that, he goes out and he kills himself. Not so, not so the, uh, the Romans. The Romans are like, that, that would be an honorable thing. You disgraced yourself and your family. Kill yourself. Not the Greeks. Notice Oedipus does not kill himself. What he does is he blinds himself. Second observation. Notice that at the moment he loses his sight, he sees. Right? Notice the irony of that. Right? At the moment he loses out sight, can I say it that way, Mr. Peterson, you understand? Loses out sight, he gains Insight. Our word, by the way, is perspicacity, right? That's our word, perspicacity, insight. The capacity to kind of go, oh, I get it. Of course, at that moment, the audience also is engaging in that moment of catharsis. What is catharsis? Now we'll work with that idea real quickly. Catharsis, the idea that the audience experiences two powerful, powerful emotions as they watch the protagonist fall. What are those two emotions? Fear and pity, or what we today would call maybe more sympathy or empathy, maybe even. Let's define both of them. Fear, of course, you're watching this happen. The fear is, oh, crap, that would like, that could happen to me. I could go away to college and meet my unknown twin, fall in love, and have four children. Oh, right? Or by extension, think about the essence of the fear here. How many times in the course of a day do you commit an action fully convinced it's the right thing to do? Totally. I mean, we could talk about this at 3B. There's at least one moment in your life when you did something and you were 100% sure it was the right thing to do, only to discover later, crap, that was the totally worst thing I could have done or said, right? We're afraid all the time then of potential actions that we might commit because we are mortals and we can't see the future. You don't know how things are always going to work out. Should I say this? Should I not say this? Should I do this? Should I not do this? The obvious question is couched in ignorance. I don't know what's going to be the outcome. Is it the right thing to tell the guy to go away and never come back? Is that the totally wrong thing to do? So you don't know completely the outcome of the events of your actions until after the fact. That's, that's fear. Pity. It's like one of my freshmen when I lectured this poem years ago said, basically that means I'm glad it happened to him and not to me. Well, that's pretty good. I mean, that's a pretty good way to think about it. But let's keep going. Aristotle is going to make a profound, <coughs> profound observation. This is one of the most important observations in the history of Western thought. He says it this way. What makes us human is our capacity to take the other perspective. Now we're back to the answer of the question, what's the difference between Schreiber and his dog? This is one more answer. For Aristotle, this is the knockdown argument. And it says it this way. Humans possess the ability to take the other perspective, to see others and their perspective and somehow appreciate that. So that while maybe you've never gone off killed your dad, married your mom, and had four kids. You are able to kind of look at the fall of the protagonist and feel empathy, sympathy, pity. Our Greek word is pathos. That is to say, wow. Well, it's not my pain, and I, and I recognize it's your pain. In some strange way, it is my pain as well. 
Now, Aristotle will take this one step further, and he'll make a really radical observation, and it is this. The one thing that makes us different from all other species on the planet is this capacity. Remove this capacity, the ability to have sympathy and empathy to take the other perspective, remove that, and we are no more than Schreiber's dog. That is to say, we are no different from any other species on the planet. Fundamentally, and this is a very conservative argument by Aristotle, and yet I think it's one that you have to grapple with. Fundamentally, that's what makes us human. Our capacity to take the other perspective. Are you ready for this? Aristotle says that can only happen in the arts. Now that is interesting. That's his core value of aesthetic theory. That's why we go to film. That's why we go to play, Aristotle says. Not to be entertained. Not even necessarily to be what you would call technically formally educated. But to have this powerful recognition of the other. That we live in a world with other human beings who have their perspective. Our perspective may not be their perspective. Our experiences may not be their experiences. And yet somehow we can identify with those experiences and live somehow better because we've identified with those experiences. That is a compelling argument for Aristotle. Finally, back to Oedipus. The play will end with the old broken man. And this is important. In the play, Oedipus is a strong, dynamic character. But by the end of the play, broken. Eyeballs gone. Blood running down his face. He is a completely shattered man. His two sons have run away immediately to start fighting with each other about who gets to be the next king because they're both sons of a king. Ultimately, they're going to end up killing each other outside the walls of, Tro uh, outside the walls of Thebes in a famous fight. His daughter, Ismene, she's this kind of fraidy cat and she's like, oh, how shameful. And she leaves. The only one that, and that Oedipus has left is his daughter Antigone. And as the play ends, Oedipus writes, he will come onto the stage being led, because now he's blind, by his daughter Antigone. And Creon, the brother of Jacusta, who has now assumed right to the throne, Creon is there. Oedipus will make Creon promise something and in return, Oedipus promises never to come back to the city of Thebes. And this is what Creon asks. Don't ever come back. You're a, bad, you're a bad, bad influence on our city. We never want you back. Oedipus is like, I agree to never come back to Thebes on one count. Promise me that you'll take care of my four children. Creon says, I promise. I will take care of your four children. The ironies, of course, will be dark. Right? Eutocles, Polynices, the two sons, will go outside the city walls. They will fight and kill each other. And then, of course, in the third leg of the trilogy, that is to say Antigone, we're going to have, we're gonna have the, the, the final issue, aren't we? And, of course, we'll talk about that one on Tuesday. The challenges of the play, then, are multi-leveled. But Aristotle will argue that the thing that's most important is that the audience goes through this powerful cathartic moment where it begins to identify with the fall of the protagonist. Now to Titanic and final observations. How do you account for the fact, Schreiber took us here, so let's answer it. How do you account for the fact that this one play, uh, this movie, is so unbelievably successful? Let me give the Aristotelian answer. Follow me. And by the way, you can drop your pins now. I mean, all you got to do is just listen. You don't need to write anything. I think you'll, I think you'll be able to even make the, make the jump yourself. Aristotle would say about the play Titanic, this is the deal. What makes this play, this movie, so powerful is think about it. You watch the film through all that love crap. You watch the film right up to the moment of the film that really starts to matter. That is to say when the boat gets ready to sink. Notice what James Cameron is able to do. He can put the audience in a powerful moment right in the middle of this film where especially when you watch it in theater, far different from watching it on DVD at home alone, you're sitting in a room with 300 or more other people. As, for example, the boat starts to sink. And watch what happens in this film. You've got two different groups, two different responses to the fact that the boat is sinking. What's the first response? 
Well, it's the individuals who, for example, go down below deck. And, for example, you have that powerful scene where the mother is telling children's story, knowing full well that the boat's about to sink and they're going to drown. Or the two old people who are clearly uh, you know, married lovers who lay down side by side in bed and you know, they're having their powerful moment. That is to say, they come to the moment of their death with some kind of, where would you say, acquiescence, acceptance. There's those people. Or, for example, those standing on deck who are somehow drawing sustenance from their theology through the playing of the, you know, the, the, the fiddle and all of that. That's one group. The second group is an intriguing group. They're the group that run like crazy fools trying to get off the boat, right? The far extreme of that is the gentleman who, for example, even will use certain kinds of nasty methods to make sure that he saves himself, even though he knows others are going to drown, right? Begging a really intriguing question. And I think, you know, as you're watching this in a theater and the guy's tumbling down, 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 kabing, he hits him, kabing, into the water, you could go up to somebody and say, hey, because of course tears are now starting to flow, maybe of a viewer, and you could say, uh, none of that's real. All of that was done on computerization, and none of those people actually hit things and drown. And it's all, it's all, it's all fabricated. You don't need to be sad, it's not real. And yet, Cameron is capable of creating a moment that seems so real that an audience member has to ask a fundamental question. What would I do in a situation where I know the boat's about to sink in the icy waters of the North Atlantic? The worst form of death is drowning. The even worser form of death is drowning in icy cold water. And you know you're about to go. There is no escaping. What do you do? Of course, our instincts are to say about ourselves that we would be noble and brave, that we've lived our life in such a way that we could accept our mortality and our death and everything would be okay. Ergo, going under the deck and laying down and preparing for our drowning death. Others of us will say, I would love to think that that's me, but I'm inclined to think, I don't know, man, this boat's going down, and I can see that a boat's about to be lowered into the water for salvation. I think i got to find a way onto that boat, even if it's through some probably not-so-nice method. I'm going to get on that boat because I want to save my can. I think this movie forced audiences into a psychic moment, and it bothered us as we went to this film and watched it. This is why the film ends, and so many report feeling tired, and I think this is what brought us back again to watch the film. We find ourselves going through this moment going, oh, what would I do? I don't know what I would do. I, I want to believe I would be one way, but I'm inclined to think I might not be that way. I might be a different way, and I'm not so sure I feel good about that way. <sighs> again, notice, in Aristotelian language, the audience was forced into a moment of powerful catharsis, which I will argue, and now I'm agreeing with Mr. Schreiber on this count, there are few films that have ever been made in Hollywood that elicit that level of cathartic response. But notice the majority of audience members didn't realize that's what was going on. We're talking in language, Aristotelian language, that allows us to understand, oh, this film elicits a powerful cathartic psychic moment where fear, no doubt fear, and pity, no doubt pity, is brought together in such a powerful moment that's very individual. You're sitting with three to you know, more hundred people in a room, if you're watching this in a theater, no doubt. But somehow that moment becomes deeply personal as well. What would I do? How would I respond? I wonder how I would respond. And in that moment, audience is left. Interestingly, many came back the next day to watch that long film all over again. In the end, it didn't have anything to do with Leonardo and Kate Winslet. It had to do with Cameron's capacity to create a psychic moment. And again, for most of those audience members, they had no idea what was going on. They just knew, as Aristotle said about Sophocles and Oedipus Rex, they just knew something profound was going on. They were feeling something really powerful. It does beg the question going forward now for you, from here on out. Every time you watch a dramatic film, you'll ask the question of yourself, in speaking Aristotelian language, does this film work? According to Aristotle, it should elicit those powerful emotions of fear and pity. We should point out, by the way, that through the Renaissance, the highest opera would in fact do this very thing. 
We think, of course, of Don Giovanni and other great, great plays, operas, yes. For those of you who have enjoyed, for example, the Broadway performance of Les Miserables, you will understand this is exactly, I mean, this is just proof exactly what we're talking about. From this point on, of course, you'll begin to ask this question. If I sit in a film and it doesn't elicit that kind of powerful response, have I wasted my two hours? Is it kind of a waste of time? This will become the critique of comedy. Aristotle will say, comedy is not like tragedy. It doesn't elicit the same kind of powerful emotions. It allows us to laugh and the like. But it isn't the same thing, and to that degree, it's not as valuable. Hmm. That'll be an interesting debate as we go forward. I will make the argument later that, in fact, comedy is something quite different. I think it's rooted in a tremendously conservative voice that I'll share with you, but I'll do that in a later lecture. Thank you. So let's get ready now. We